Kids are happy a new school is coming. Because we could just walk here. One soldier's message for the new minister. Take some time, travel around, and listen to veterans. Pretty nice Wednesday shaping up across the province. We are clouding up. We're going to bring some rain and showers into the mix Thursday, Friday, and into the weekend. The details are coming up. Good evening. Tonight we have more details on that young family killed in Sunday's crash near Bellevue. Yeah, relatives are remembering the parents as loving and devoted and a young boy who lived for softball. Here now is Terry Roberts has their story. Scenes of happier times. A growing family in Conception Bay South making memories on and off the field. But it all came to a violent end on Sunday when two vehicles crashed head on. Michael and Paula Ryan, husband and wife, their 11-year-old son, Michael Jr., dead at the scene, returning from a youth softball tournament in Clarenville. Michael was from Southern Harbor, worked installing rebar at Muskrat Falls. Paula Ryan worked at the home hardware in CBS and talked to us about winter weather just before Christmas in 2014. She grew up in Northwest Brook, near Clarenville. Michael Jr., about to begin grade six at Villanova Junior High, a life so young, ended too early. Mikey was an 11-year-old boy who loved ball. He loved hitting the field, whether for practice or game. He loved Xbox with his friends. He definitely had his own style. Mikey had his own clothes style. He loved to have his hair a certain way. He was his own person, 100%. The family's 13-year-old daughter didn't make the trip to Clarenville and she's probably alive today because of it. But now she's facing a horrible reality, saying a final goodbye on Thursday to her parents and brother. But her aunt says her extended family will watch over her. Rachel has a very secure and loving future ahead of her because with her family, there's no other outcome for her. There's nothing she'll ever need or want for because we're here for her. The fourth victim was the 18-year-old driver of the second vehicle. Funeral services for Sarah Ann Stride will be held in Lewisport on Friday. She is being described as vivacious, fearless, and compassionate. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, now to another story about a serious car accident. This one on the Port of Port Peninsula. It's left a young man in hospital with life-threatening injuries. And while police are still investigating, some locals are wondering what role speed played in the early morning crash on Sunday. Here now is Colleen Connors takes us to the scene of the accident in Piccadilly. Well, three friends were out for a drive Saturday night, early Sunday morning, when things took a horrible turn. So the 19-year-old driver was coming along this stretch of the main road in Piccadilly when he hit an embankment and the vehicle flipped over and landed right here in this scene. Now the 19 year old driver and one of the passengers, a 16 year old, they were thrown from the vehicle. They didn't have their seat belts on. Another passenger, 21 years old, was found still in the vehicle with her seat belt on when paramedics and emergency crews showed up at the scene here. And this is quite a devastating sight on the side of the road in Piccadilly. You can clearly see that the vehicle flipped in this area. There's parts of things of the vehicle. There's parts of uh, CD cases and, and identification all along the side of the road here today. Now, the 19-year-old driver was sent to hospital in St. John's. He's in intensive care with life-threatening injuries. The 16-year-old and the 21-year-old passengers, well, they were brought to hospital with injuries as well. Now, these three are from this area, and everyone around here is concerned and wondering how they're doing. Many locals, of course, are asking if speeding played a factor in this horrible accident. And I think the reason that that's the first thing that comes to everyone's mind is that this stretch of road is very common for speeding. Vehicles tend to go much higher than the 50 kilometer an hour or 60 kilometer an hour speed limit. Although many locals here think that speeding may have played a role, the RCMP are saying that the investigation is still ongoing and there's no confirmation of speed yet. Now collision analysts are still analyzing and looking at all of this area and trying to determine exactly what happened to make this car flip and go off the road. And of course, many people here are just concerned for the driver and the two passengers. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Piccadilly. 
Well, politicians and parents gathered in paradise to announce the location of a brand new school in the community. It'll be the fifth school in the rapidly growing town, but the first one to include junior high school grades. Here and now's Mark Quinn was there. It's something parents in paradise have been calling for for a long time. And today, there are even some future students here. Awesome. Yeah? And why do you like it? Because we could just walk here. Catherine and Victoria Pelly's mother is pleased too. She says today's announcement means that by the time her girls are ready for junior high, there should be a brand new school close to home. I think it's awesome. It's absolutely fabulous to have a you know intermediate school here in Paradise. With a population of more than 21,000, Paradise is one of the fastest growing towns in Atlantic Canada. Right now, there are four elementary schools in this community, and the mayor says an intermediate school for grades 5 to 8 is a great addition. This builds community, keeping the children in the community, uh, and uh, overall, it's, you know, how you grow a community, and this is part of it. But of course, politicians like Bobbitt are always looking to the future. He'd like to see a time when no students are bussed out of town. We would love to see the high school as well. And, uh, you know, obviously, like I said earlier, the growth is there in Paradise. Uh, we've had 70% growth in the last 10 years. Uh, all of our estimates and all of our projections and the information that we've been gathering uh, shows us that we're still going to see a potential growth there in Paradise. Now, the exact location of the new school hasn't been revealed yet, but it is expected to open somewhere near here, the Diane Whalen Soccer Complex. The school is expected to open in 2020 or 2021. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Paradise. Well, a forgery charge against Marystown Mayor Sam Sinyard has been dismissed, just as he said it would be. Sinyard had been charged with forging an affidavit. Today, he told CBC that all he did was witness the signature of a man who stored a motorhome in a garage owned by a town councillor. Sinyard said people likely thought he had committed some sort of terrible crime. He said he knew all along that he would be exonerated. They say they were yelled at, belittled, even reduced to tears. That's how some former College of the North Atlantic students describe treatment from instructors. Earlier this month, CBC Investigates told you about a report on the respiratory, ther respiratory therapy program, which has lost its accreditation. The report cited concerns about students' emotional safety. Now, former students are speaking out. Jen White has that story. I would describe it as abuse, right? Um, like emotional abuse. That's really all, like, this was six years ago, I still get this emotional talking about it. Nicola Park is still deeply affected by her time at the College of the North Atlantic. About how she says she was treated by the clinical instructors of its respiratory therapy program. It was always being yelled at and um, like you couldn't just, you couldn't ask a question. And if you did ask a question, you were belittled and made to feel like you shouldn't be there or that... Um, yeah, like you, you, should, you should just know it already. But this is something that's been going on for a long time. Laura Lewis also tears up while thinking back on those years. She was averaging A's in all of her courses in 2010 until she started her clinical training. In her final year of the program, she missed the first two weeks due to illness, something that was mentioned throughout the term. But I was told on a constant basis that I was too slow, I wasn't going to be able to catch up, and that I should do second year again. My marks were one of the highest in that program between 80s and 90s and there was no reason for that to ever be suggested to me and made me feel that I couldn't do this. Both women brought their complaints to the college but say their issues weren't addressed. Also I was told by the head person at the time that their their instructors wouldn't act like that, they wouldn't get on like that. Park and Lewis both quit. A report from June looked at issues with the program over the previous year and a half. It outlined concerns with students' emotional safety, unprofessional behavior by an unnamed person at clinical training sites, creating a learning environment perceived as intimidating and not supportive of learning. Evidence indicates that this also contributes to the high program attrition rate. CNA previously told CBC Investigates the personnel involved with the respiratory therapy program are no longer employed by the college. 
CNA and the Minister of Advanced Education both declined interviews. In a statement, the college says it takes the loss of the program's accreditation extremely seriously. It says CNA is working diligently to ensure the systemic and specific issues identified in the report are addressed. The minister says the college is in the final stages of developing a solution for impacted students who are their top priority. Both Park and Lewis are now working, but not in respiratory therapy. The women say they hope the college takes a serious look at its suspended program so that no one else has to go through what they experienced. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Well, whether you loved it or hated it, it's all coming to an end tomorrow night. Chase the Ace in Goulds is set for a mega draw grand finale. Yeah, and organizers say they're going out with a bang. Here now, Zach Gowdy has been on this story all summer and is in the Goulds. So, Zach, what's in store for tomorrow night? Well, even people like me who have been coming all summer will walk in here at St. Kevin's Parish Hall tomorrow and know right away that this time is different. As you can see, the Chase the Ace organizers have gone all out on tomorrow's grand finale. They've got lights, they've got decorations, a big sound system, and no matter what happens, it's going to be a night to remember in Goulds. Of course, for the Chase the Ace volunteers, it has been a year to remember, and perhaps for no one more so than Carol O'Brien. You've come to know her as the Chase the Ace announcer, the face of the Ace, a role that has made her a bona fide local celebrity. So this afternoon, I sat down with Carol O'Brien to talk about this amazing story and to look ahead to the one final chapter. Pete says to me, we're doing your backdrop for you. And I said, well, where's my hair and makeup people kind of thing, right? So, uh, well, they're setting up some lighting system and we got um, some sound systems that we're getting rigged up. We may as well finish off with a bang. We're going, this is our 40, what, fourth week. And uh, we figure if we're going to go, we're going to go out uh, blazing. <laughs> Happy and sad all in one. Right, and delighted and thankful that it, it has run so smoothly. We've had the cooperation of so many people in the community, our volunteers. I mean, there's a whole list of people that I could go through, and everyone has worked together phenomenally. Like, I mean, there's just no words to express it, really. We didn't really have a goal when we said that. We had our wish list that we wanted to accomplish, and we have raised enough now to complete our wish list and keep us out of the red for a few years, hopefully, unless things go, you know, through the roof with everything. But yes, it's going to be wild. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining things in my head, but I'm sure it's going to surpass even that. T tomorrow night here and now will be live from Chase the Ace in the Goulds. Myself, Arianna Kell and Jeremy Eaton. I think we're even going to kidnap Ryan Snodden for the grand finale. And of course, on our Facebook Live, we'll bring you the big show starting at around 7.45, just before the ticket sale cutoff at 8 p.m. Then uh, the draw, it could take a half hour. It could take up to four hours. But no matter how long it takes to find that Ace of Spades, we'll keep you there. Reporting live in Goulds, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Well, after the break, how a team of engineers from Newfoundland and Labrador beat out universities from around the world.
Welcome back, everyone, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just going to let you take it away right at the beginning to talk about Hurricane Harvey. That's right, and uh, have a look. Some incredible new images give us a new perspective on the size of Tropical Storm Harvey. Uh, of course, made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane, now a tropical storm. These photos were taken aboard the International Space Station, showing just how large and powerful uh, this storm is, uh, offering a unique perspective of uh, just a massive, massive storm. Of course, when uh, I'm looking at the images, I'm often looking, trying to get in and look at the, the little low level uh, detail of this storm. But of course, when you look back and uh, from above at the International Space Station, just breathtaking images there. Now, in terms of the rainfall, how about today? Because we made they made more progress, not the progress they want to make. Uh, Houston Weather Office, five day total now over 1000 millimeters and a new record has been set uh, for the continental US. This is the largest tropical storm on record in terms of rainfall. Uh, have a look at that 1253 millimeters. That is over four feet of rain in five days recorded in Southeast Houston. That is an unofficial uh, number. So if they confirm that, that will be the new record for a tropical uh, system, a tropical cyclone anywhere in the continental US since 1950. And compare that to the normals for a year in Houston and of course the normals for a year here in St. John's for rainfall. As I mentioned last night, we do get the nod when it comes to snowfall, but just some impressive totals. Five days what they normally see in a year in Houston, what we normally see in a year here in St. John's. Tropical Storm Harvey, unfortunately, has, is now moving back out uh, over water, and so it will continue to fuel itself and continue to rain itself out through the night tonight, through the day tomorrow, starting to taper off as we work through into the Thursday, Friday time period, but more rain to come. Keeping an eye on this system as well. It's been off the southeast coast of the U.S. the last couple of days. Uh, keeping an eye on it for our interests. Uh, potential tropical storm 10. The window almost closed. Doesn't look like it'll become a tropical storm, but uh, we'll still have some impact on our province and particularly southeastern Newfoundland, and we'll run you through that in just a moment. Current temperatures, how about Happy Valley Goose Bay? The hot spot right now, 27 degrees, and it's been a beautiful day in Labrador. Lots of sunshine there. Bit of cloud cover is kicked up over the afternoon across the Avalon. That is thanks to this system, which will be shooting to our east, but will continue to throw some cloud cover into the mix through the day tomorrow. There is uh, that... Uh, Tropical system, not a tropical storm, but certainly tropical uh, in nature in terms of the rainfall that it will be bringing up in this neck of the woods. And here's how it will play out. There's the cloud cover that will continue to linger across the Avalon. Tomorrow morning will start near 10 low lying areas in central towards west, dipping into those low to mid single digits yet again. Double digit start in through Labrador as we roll throughout the day tomorrow. That cloud will ease into the afternoon. That's the good news. We'll see a little more in the way of sunshine tomorrow evening. Just a great day across the island. Some showers uh, building in for tomorrow evening and into the overnight in Lab West. The 7 to 7 goes chase the ace because, you know, 70, 80 odd thousand people or more will be there tomorrow. And if you're lining up early on, yeah, 10 degrees, some sunny breaks, uh, even into the afternoon. The biggest Part of the forecast tomorrow will be those northerly winds. They'll have a, a bit of a bite for sure at gusts 40 to 50 kilometers per hour. That'll keep temperatures capped near 17. Tomorrow evening around draw time should be still around 13 degrees. 16, 17 along that northeast coast with that northerly wind. We'll get into the high teens, low 20s over the west and southwest coast and into the uh, nice 23, 24 degree range. Grand Falls, Falls Windsor to the Humber Valley tomorrow. Hot spots tomorrow will again be Grand Falls, uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay to Makovic and Cartwright and low 20s in the west. We'll talk about your long range detail as uh, right through the long weekend. Coming up, Peter. Well, thanks, Ryan. It has the potential to change the way humans travel, and a team from Newfoundland and Labrador are pioneers in developing the technology. Over the weekend, Paradigm Hyperloop came second in an international competition organized by Elon Musk, the man behind SpaceX and Tesla. 
Well, the idea is to build big tubes between cities. You pump out the air and that allows these pods to travel at almost the speed of sound. It would cut down the travel time for people and freight. Now, over the weekend, the team from Memorial University, they partnered with Northwestern University. They ran their pod that you can see here on the SpaceX test track, reaching 100 kilometers an hour, the second highest speed. Team lead Adam Keating is in California. So you were one of only three teams in the entire world that actually made it to the finals. How did you manage to get into the finals in this international competition? It was a, it was a long process. It's been almost two years working on this project. And we competed in the competition in January and won the top 10 teams. But we, were, we didn't get to do our full, final full-scale run at a higher speed. So we were extremely determined for the last eight months to be able to get back to this point, have the opportunity to be in the final three. Um, we basically went through six, seven days of intense testing at SpaceX. And at the end of it, we were selected as one of the three teams to be able to go on Sunday and compete for the top speed. And so take me through that run that you actually did. <laughs> yeah, it was probably two hours of the most nervous part of my entire life, I would say. Um, there's a lot of people watching, and also for us, it was the first time we'd ever gone anything above about 20 miles an hour at this point. Um, we've done a lot of work to prove that it's safe, but anytime you're going to push your technology like that, there's a lot at stake. So we were very, very sure that it was safe, but actually going through and seeing it up on the screen, uh, watching it through the monitors as it did it, it was, it was an incredible feeling, but it was definitely one that made us... Uh, I mean, it's definitely has to keep on our toes and be ready to go for whatever could happen. So at the end of that run, I think that was probably the most relieved any of us have ever been. And it was, it was an amazing feeling to finish that. So you're up against some of the top university teams from around the world. What was it like to represent Newfoundland and Labrador and to be able to prove that people here have the talents, the skills, and the expertise to compete at that international level? I think it's amazing. I mean, two years ago, I, I never would have thought that it was possible for us to do something like this, or even personally, I think it was possible for myself to do something like this. Um, and in the last two years, I've really realized that it is possible for people from Newfoundland, people from Mun, to do things like this. I mean, we're one, we were the only team in North America in the final three. Um, we're the first team ever to do an air bearing Hyperloop run in the entire world, it's an indoor commercial. Uh, we've built a vehicle that floats on air and weighs almost 2,000 pounds and designed for almost 200 miles an hour. And these are things that two years ago, I probably would have never told you I thought was possible. But now after finishing this, I think the sky is the limit for this team and for really anyone in Newfoundland. Does this feel a bit like the Wright Brothers moment, the sort of first <laughs> takeoff for a new piece of technology? It, it just sure did the first time we got through. And we did our 20-mile-an-hour run the day before, and we saw it successfully work. Uh, I think a tear almost came to my eye because I was so happy that it was uh, after paying off after two years. But I think there's a huge upside to this. Um, you're seeing teams in just a week of testing be able to push pretty impressive speeds for what is a student competition on a short track. So I think you're really going to see this pick up even more in the next year and then see this technology become viable. So what happens to the technology you developed and the team that's been working on this competition for two years? So our team's definitely staying together. Um, we're going to be entering competition three. So SpaceX announced on Sunday there will be a third competition. And we're also looking at potentially doing commercial options for some of our technology, uh, given how successful it's been and the interest that we've received. So the next year is definitely going to be exciting. Uh, we're looking forward to what's next. Well, congratulations, and thanks for joining me. Well, thanks so much for having us. I appreciate it. Coming up after the break, we'll speak to Seamus O'Regan about being the new Minister of Veterans Affairs. My new co-host, Anthony Germain, gets advice from an Afghanistan veteran. Stay with us.
Well, Newfoundland MP Seamus O'Regan is getting briefed on his new job as Minister of Veterans Affairs, but he's found time to be here. We're glad to welcome him. We're going to chat in just a few minutes, but first, we want to run an interview my colleague Anthony Germain did with Newfoundland soldier Jamie McWhorter. He authored a book on his battle with post-traumatic stress disorder. He has serious concerns about the lack of support for a battle many veterans are losing, a battle with addictions and mental health issues. Jamie, Seamus O'Regan, the new Minister of Veterans Affairs, what do you think? You know what, uh, when I first heard about it, Anthony, I went online. I want to see what everyone else thought before I <laughs> open my mouth, right? Uh, there were mixed emotions when I looked online. So uh, in my opinion, I like it. First of all, he's Newfoundland there, so right off the bat, you have my vote on that. Yeah. I am a Newfoundlander, Seamus, so yeah. right on. Um, second of all, um, well first, we go back to Newfoundland. Every Newfoundlander knows about veterans. Every Newfoundlander has a veteran in their family. The second thing is, uh, he has a lot of good PR. I mean, he's he's been with communicator. The, he understands television. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And he's friends with JT, yeah. and that's always good, right? right? When you're friends with JT. Some people criticize that, but you know, does, does being a friend of Trudeau's mean you can't get a job? I mean, come on. Uh, one interesting thing that came up in the announcement yesterday when Seamus was invited to the cabinet was he was asked about his drinking, and I wonder what you think about the fact that you've got a minister who's been through detox himself, would a minister like that possibly have more sympathy for some of the people you help with the PTSD buddies? Have you watched the House of Commons channel? I have. And I tell you right now, I'm sure Shane was not the only one drinking in the House of Commons. But he is probably the only one who come forward, admitted he had a problem, mm -hmm. faced it, yeah. overcame it. And he's a hard working man. And he has overcome this little thing, or I shouldn't say little thing, but the, this addiction thing, yeah. right? And I'm sure there's people in his comments who are probably hiding it, right? Yeah. But he has faced it. And there are veterans who come home and I don't I hate to say it, but turn to the bottle or turn to drugs. Drugs or whatever. I mean maybe he can shine some light and show them the right direction with this, right? So you have a young minister here, uh, he's getting briefed on a department, his first time in cabinet. What advice would you give him? Because you mentioned that a lot of veterans are talking to you about one particular issue. Take some time, travel around and listen to veterans. Actually listen to them. I mean, uh, you can go, to, Seamus, you can go to any legion in Canada and he'll, they'll let you come in, sit down, and listen to the veterans. Uh, they'll tell you, they, they are not shy people. They'll tell you exactly what they need. Uh, I mean, people ask me, are we doing enough for veterans? Seamus, there's no such thing as enough for veterans. Look what they've done for us, right? Let's do what we can, let's give them what they need, right? And right now, you're put in a position, Seamus. You're put in an office that's already messed up, right? And you got some big shoes to fill that are already uncomfortable to wear, right? So uh, I wish you the best. Uh, I'm behind you. I, for one, am behind Seamus. And, uh, and uh, we'll see what he can do. Uh, that's right. I mean, you can't give someone bad credit for a job he hasn't even started yet. All right, fair right? enough. I think he can do a good job. He's a hard working man. And uh, he's got my support. All right. Jamie, all the best. Always good to talk to you. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. All right. Debbie? And thanks very much to Anthony and Jamie. So, uh, Minister O'Regan. Yes. Uh, Jamie seems uh, ready to cut you a bit of slack, at least for now. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering, to his point about, uh, and Anthony's point, that you've been through detox, you've had mm -hmm. your battles with addictions. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that's going to influence uh, the way you deal with veterans who are battling some of those same problems. I think it gives you empathy. Um, you know, one of the reasons I had problems too was because uh, I went through a period where I wasn't working. I mean, that kind of, you know, everybody thinks you went from Canada AM to, to politics. And I had a few years in between there that were tough, uh, that were rough. And uh, so I understand the importance too of just of regular empo employment in a stable environment. You know, those are all very important things for your mental health. So, you know, I think I, I do bring some empathy to it. Um, I'm happy that Jamie gives me the benefit of the doubt, to be honest with you. That's very, very good of him. And, and you're quite right. I mean, at the end of the day, I'll be judged by the results I bring to bear. But I, I think, you know, when he talks about benefit of the doubt, that's, the, that's something that the department and me as minister have to give to our veterans as well. When they're calling and they're asking about benefits that are owed to them or training that they're inquiring about or emergency funding for caregivers, all that we're, you know, putting more money in, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm. The uh, Veterans Affairs Department, uh, as you 
no doubt, no, just does have its challenges. It There's does. understaffing that uh, people say has led to a delay in getting these legitimate benefits to veterans. Um, how are you going to measure success against the needs? I think you measure success by talking to veterans and finding out, you know, whether how do, how do they feel about the work so that we're doing So you're going to take Jamie's advice? Oh, most definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's the way I do things anyway. I plan on visiting a lot of legions. Um, you know, yesterday I got sworn in. Uh, I spent about five hours then with departmental officials um, getting briefed on what I needed to be briefed on. And then this morning flew home. And uh, I'm happy to be home for a couple of days and I get to catch chase the ace tomorrow night, so this is just a bonus <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, which is in my riding, just wanted to point out. And, and then I go to Prince Edward Island, and that's where the department's located. And uh, so we have, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest employers in Prince Edward Island. And uh, so I have a lot of people to talk to there. We've had great work that Minister Hare has done. I have a, an incredibly able deputy minister and senior team that I met with, uh, many of whom are veterans themselves, um, and who are really, you know, attempting to... Uh, you know, to to right the ship, and and they're and they're getting and they're getting some results. So I just plan on continuing with that and and uh, and, and and moving on. I mean, I, I want to make sure that Jamie, he's given us the benefit of the doubt. I want to make sure, you know, we give him the same. Twenty four hours in the position. I mean, is there uh, one? Pretty, almost exactly <laughs> twenty four hours. Is there one priority right at the top that you're going to tackle? Compassion compassion towards. I think if you have compassion, if you have care, and ultimately what that demonstrates is respect for our veterans. I think, I think once you have those, you know, the people who, who work in Veterans Affairs, when they have those values, and, and uh, many of them, many of them do, the many that I've talked to already, <laughs> I've talked to quite a few in the past 24 hours, um, you know, that, that, that means that we give the benefit of the doubt to our veterans, and that's what they deserve. You um, are this province's eyes and ears in cabinet now. You're also a very, very good friend of Justin Trudeau. It has its benefits. It has its liabilities. <laughs> well, I let's mean, talk about that. Yeah. Because I, 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 around the cabinet table, I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. you are representing, as I say, you're the eyes and ears for this province. You have this deep friendship. How is that going to influence how things play out around the cabinet table, do you think? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the friendship bit first, because I, I, I mean, it's kind of important. Um, you know, I think I bring a lot to bear on my own, uh, aside from being a friend of the Prime Minister, and I get lambasted, like, uh, somehow, you know, that's the reason I got it. I, I had some excellent teachers. I've, I've worked three years for Edward Roberts as his executive assistant when he was Minister of Justice. Uh, two years with Brian Tobin as a senior policy advisor when he was premier. I've studied the Newfoundland economy in Ireland. I've studied Muskrat Falls and Inu uh, and, and a possible Inu, Inu equity stake in Muskrat Falls at Cambridge University. I've, I've worked hard on the issues in this province and I've worked hard in my time. That rubs you the wrong way, this friendship uh, No, reference. I am very <laughs> proud of being his friend. Yeah. Uh, there is no question. I just don't want it to, I just want to make sure that people understand that I bring more to that mm -hmm. as a representative. Than, than a friendship with the prime minister. No, I'm very proud. He's a, you know, he's going well beyond him being prime minister or his leader. And before he got into politics, I would count him as amongst my, one of my closest friends. And and that really came to bear, to be honest with you, when I needed help, um, you know, two years ago. Uh, he was one of the best friends I could ask for, and you know, now technically my boss. And he was the one who said, "I need you to go away. I need you to get better, mm -hmm. because I need you 100 percent. Your province needs you 100 percent. Your constituents need you 100 percent, and your family, friends, and husband need you 100 percent." Well, it's going to be an interesting dynamic around that cabinet table, I believe. And I've got people... big shoes to fill. I've got <laughs> Judy Foote's shoes to fill, our yeah. skipper. Uh, but we've got a tight team of seven members of parliament, and as I, you know, I've said online before, we, we disagree, but more often than not, we agree, and we're a tight team. And a lot of our other caucus members look to us and go, these guys are organized and get their priorities straight, and they fight hard, and we work hard, and we do. Seamus O'Regan, thank you very much for spending a bit of time with us today. Thank you, Debbie. A campground on Labor Day weekend? Uh, no, we're in Goulds, and all of these campers are here for Chase the Ace tomorrow night. Now, take a guess. How many RVs do you think are here on the grounds? The answer, after the break.
And we are going back to the ghouls where people are lining up already for tomorrow's big chase, the ace. Uh, it is the finale, of course, and they're not at the door, but in campers where the grounds of St. Kevin's Church has been turned into a trailer park. Yeah, here now, Zach Gowdy is live with us again. Zach, you gave us a little guess beforehand. We had a little bit of homework, but uh, now give us the answer. How many RVs are there out there already? Okay, so take a look. There is a row of RVs way back there. There's another row right here where I'm standing. This goes on, and then there's all of these. I've been told by people here who have gone around and counted that there are 37 RVs right here on the grounds of St. Kevin's, but of course, there is RVs parked in just about every parking lot in this area of Goulds, from bid goods to the racetrack and anywhere they can squeeze in. You know, I remember about a month ago, we thought it was a big deal when the first one or two RVs showed up here at Chase the Ace. And one of those early campers was Patty Scott from Colinette. He's still here, folks, and I asked him what his summer of Ace has been like on the road. Uh, well, I got a notification yesterday morning that if I didn't get here, I wasn't going to get it. So, uh, wife came up and she parked the vehicle here, and then when I got off work, I brought it up. How that many weeks have you guys been bringing the RV out here to chase these? Uh, over a month more now. We've been, we started down on the parking lot, and I think the first time you interviewed the wife, and, that, and then and we had to move up because where it was out, oh, we're not bringing trailers, so. Traveling all around the Havilland with this now over a month, gypsies on wheels. Has the ace kept you here on the Avalon? Yes, yeah, it did. It, like you said, it, you got that fixture, right? You know, you got to go. You you tried it. It's getting bigger, and you, so you got to stick to it, right? So it's next tomorrow night. It's coming home with me. I got the wheel. I got the wheels. Put all them Tonys in. <laughs> He certainly has the room. I wouldn't be surprised if Patty is in his trailer watching himself on TV right now. And of course, you can see the show tomorrow night right here on Here and Now. We've got the pregame from 6 to 7, all the action here on the field to chase the ace, and then the big show will be on our Facebook Live tomorrow night. The game will start around 7.45 Island time. Uh, the structure of the game, they will just keep pulling cards until someone finds the ace. There are eight cards left. It could come on the first card. It could go all the way to the eighth card. It could be an early show or a very late night in Goulds. But hey, we'll keep you with the action every step of the way. Reporting live, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Well, thank you very much, Zach. And uh, the next question will be how many porta potties they have? Because I could see the lineup <laughs> behind Zach. <laughs> when you got 70,000 people, more than 35, I hope. <laughs> Those RVs probably have their own. That's oh yeah, true. you've got your the own facilities. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. but you could probably <laughs> actually line up. Uh, you know, people could pay to come use the facilities oh. there. The bedding, <laughs> the uh, little bit of cooking. You know, I'll pay you twenty bucks if I can cook up some uh, supper. The Chase here. the Ace glamping experience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But next time, one of the questions, of course, 70,000 people outside. What's the weather going to be like? Yeah. yeah, forecast looks good, which is, you know, it doesn't look overly hot, too. You don't want to be standing in line baking in 27 degree heat. So we're going to drop the temps for you a little bit. 17 degrees, not too bad, a little mm -hmm. cloudy, so have to worry too much about lapping on the sunscreen. Uh, and it's the next day that we have to worry about this system, which uh, not going to become a tropical storm. It still has some tropical characteristics right now, but we'll be transitioning into a regular old fall system over the next 24 hours or so. And then it's going to be rolling northeastward. There it is there. A brief area of high pressure uh, keeping us quiet over the next 24 hours or so. There it is there. Uh, not strong enough to keep the clouds away from the Avalon for tomorrow, where I think, again, the clouds are a little more dominant for St. John's, the Avalon, even up towards the Bonavista Peninsula tomorrow afternoon. Sunshine dominates under that area of high pressure for pretty much everybody else. We're into the low 20s. Again, a little cooler uh, from St. John's up the northeast coast with that added cloud cover and those northerly winds. 
20 in Lab City, 25 Happy Valley Goose Bay to Makovic. That front will roll in for you folks through the day on Thursday, bringing some clouds and some showers. And here is our fall system, which is going to be rolling in from the south. That'll stream up some periods of rain. Still some disagreement on the exact timing. Looks like perhaps around supper time for Thursday, certainly by eve uh, by eight, nine o'clock in the evening. Looks like we will be into some of those showers, even some steadier periods of rain. But for the most part, Thursday itself does look dry. Temperatures near 16 degrees. Uh, we're going to be warming up over central and western parts of the island. But note the cloud cover is really dominating across the island on Thursday, especially by the end of the day. We are looking at those showers moving through Labrador. And yes, that is a high of seven degrees in Labrador City on the other side of that front, which means business. That is wet snow mixing in folks. Labrador City Wabush could see some yeah, some flurry action. Breaking out the F word already uh, by the time we get to Friday morning it's at least wet flurries mixing in now for Friday morning on the island northerly winds shower chances for pretty much everybody is that first low pulls away our next low moves in so yeah Friday is unfortunately looking a little cool with shower chances at least uh, forecast models actually at odds at how much precip is going to be available here for Friday itself looks like a better chance of some rain moving in for the Friday night into Saturday early morning morning time period and then some gradual clearing through Saturday afternoon, but that northerly wind punches in. And so Saturday's not so great sunshine wise. Sunday's a better day. Note the little winds uh, arrows there coming from a more southerly direction as we roll into the later parts of Sunday and Monday. So yeah, a cool start to our long weekend, but it looks like a warmer finish and a brighter finish as well. That said, another system will be tracking in quickly through the day on Monday and does bring rain to the west uh, in Labrador again. Definitely Saturday into Sunday improving for Western Labrador. It looks like we'll get at least Sunday in for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Okay, that uh, theme means we're going to meet our young athlete of the day who is 10 year old Sarah Johnston from Reedville. She loves to skate and has been a member of the Deer Lake Skate Club since she was five. Sarah also participates in karate with Marcus Karate Schools and recently earned her orange belt. Way to go, Sarah. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. We'll hear more from the former students of the College of the North Atlantic's suspended respiratory therapy program. That's right after the break.
Welcome back to Here Now and back to our top story. Two former students from the College of the North Atlantic are speaking out about their experience in the respiratory therapy program. In an unprecedented move, the program lost its accreditation in June. A report that looked at the previous year and a half cited concerns about students' emotional safety. Yeah, Nicola Park and Laura Lewis were students in the program about six years ago, but they're still deeply affected by it. So I can remember it was my first time doing a procedure and it's a procedure, it's called suctioning. It's where you put actually like a small vacuum into someone's lung um, to remove what shouldn't be there. Um, so it was my first time. My instructor told me to go over do the procedure. She would be right over. So I went over and I waited for her because I knew she would only be a minute. And when she got to, over to me, she yelled at me in front of the patients, all the patient's family members who were in the area, all the doctors, nurses, other medical staff. And you know, this is my, one of my first experiences in the hospital. One of my, you know, first experiences doing this thing. Um, throughout the whole program, you felt like you could not ask a question. Um, you were reprimanded if you didn't know the answer for something. I should have done this in the lab. I should know what I'm doing. Like, and yes, we did practice in the lab, but in the lab you're practicing on mannequins. There's no consequences, right? So, you know, your first time on a real human, you want, you want some support, you want some guidance, right? Um, and there was absolutely none of that. I went and made a complaint because I was told that I wasn't cut out for it. And I was really upset that day. I went home, told my parents that I didn't want to continue the program and they were very upset and they said how could someone that is supposed to be your mentor make you feel that way and literally make you come home and look at us in the face and tell us you don't want to continue a program that you've wanted to do for years and not to get upset but it was a very difficult thing to have to go through at the time so yeah um yeah after that we went straight to the college spoke to the um, I think it was the dean at the time and basically was told you know that we we heard you know that you weren't you were falling behind and that you wouldn't be able to to finish you know your third year so what about if you came back and did second year and again was told the same thing to do second year again and my parents and I just were like why would you suggest something like that when my marks clearly show that I have a good understanding of the theory behind it this is an issue that's with clinical, not with, not with, you know, the student. But it just left a bad taste in our mouth and we couldn't get anywhere with it. So I left the program and started a new program at the, um, at the Engineering uh, College North Atlantic. So I did chemical process uh, instead because I was, you know, made to feel that I wasn't cut out for that respiratory therapy program. Now again, both the College of the North Atlantic and the Minister of Advanced Education declined CBC's request for interviews. Yeah, and this story is generating a lot of feedback on social media with many other former students sharing their stories about their experiences with CNA instructors. For more, head to the CBCNL Facebook page, but come back because Ryan has a great photo coming up for you that will make you want to head out onto the water.
Welcome back. Explorers have discovered a new picture of an odd creature. Yeah, the pictures were taken deep in the ocean off British Columbia. It's called a cockatoo squid, and you can probably <laughs> see why. The resemblance to its feathered namesake is pretty unmistakable. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, it's actually a burst of tentacles coming from the top of its head. Other than that, nearly completely transparent. Wow. Not much good eating than that. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, a quick look at the next three days, and uh, you can see that we're looking at uh, you know cloud cover dominating over the Avalon tomorrow, but overall a pretty nice day. Uh, Thursday, again, cloudier right across the board. Some showers moving to the south coast by the end of the day. Uh, St. John's, I think, into the mix uh, around supper time. And then Friday, unsettled for most of us. Saturday still looks cool. We'll recover into Sunday, which will be a day that uh, in Isle of Mort should look just like this. Oh, oh, very nice. That is gorgeous. Yes, of course, on the southwest coast. And Kathy Savory with a great picture there. Lots of color and just a beautiful, beautiful day. It's almost like jelly bean row houses, right? With Absolutely. all those gorgeous colors. Okay, well. So tomorrow I'm going to be heading to the Goulds. So well, wish me luck. <laughs> and everybody else. So you better Me start driving though. now because yeah. I'm pretty sure the lineup of traffic has already started. That's right. Yeah. But we want to throw with uh, something a little uh, out to go out on the Goulds. Yeah. Some of you uh, likely saw a familiar face on our program tonight. Uh, of course, we're talking about former morning show host Anthony Germain. Yeah. Y yep. He's going to be your new co-host starting uh, in just a few weeks. But in the meantime, you know, he's getting his... We're sending him out in the field, you know, right. go do uh, some stories out there before we let him come back to the comfort of the studio. That's so. right. So welcome to the team, uh, Mr. Germain, and he is also going to be in the Goulds tomorrow. Is he? Yes. He's not working for us, is he? Yes. Yeah, he's going to be tweeting. That's yeah, that's right. right. And yes. doing whatever. Yeah, uh, shaking funny. hands, kissing babies. You know? <laughs> well, everyone wants to be out there, you know, like, because it... I guess it, it's at least nice that everyone knows that this is going to be the very last one, because I know some people love it. Other people will just be glad to see the end of it, but at least it'll be over. Yeah, right. it will be over. And our program is almost over. Just have a listen to this tribute to Chase the Ace. Twas the night before Chase and all through the ghouls, the organizers were busy double-checking their rules. The RVs were parked all snug in a row as everyone knew that the jackpot would go. The players were busy gathering 20s, pulling out change drawers and cashing in empties. Thousands will flock to the parish all rowdy for a chance to win millions or at least meet Zach Gowdy. On Patsy, on Keith, on Bob and on Carol, on 4-H kids with ice cream in a barrel. To the top of the stage at St. Kevin's Hall, now cash away, cash away, cash away all.